So within all of these different interlocking institutions that we have um, with private property and markets and firms, um, what's really fascinating about all of this, though, is that there's no official coordination between everybody. Um, there's no government agency that decides that the Laurel Ingalls Wilder family farm will be a dairy farm and their neighbor cannot be a dairy farm. It must be some other sort of farm um, that just kind of emerges naturally. And so one one fascinating um, way of looking at this, here's Atlanta here. Um, if you imagine kind of a CVS in downtown Atlanta, um, it has its, its um, shelves full of food and it decides what it's going to um, purchase and sell to people. And so if you think of one specific food item, like a bag of Skittles, they have Skittles in a couple of places in the store, like in the main candy aisle and then in the aisle right before you check out um, so they can get your money um, with impulse buying. Um, so they decide somehow um, how many Skittles they should buy and what price they should set. And that price just comes naturally. What's fascinating is there's no um, ministry of Skittles in the United States that determines the price of Skittles. Um, even like the Mars company that, generate, that generates, that creates Skittles, they don't have like set prices and they require people to um, sell Skittles at a specific price. It just kind of happens. And so what's really fascinating is if you ask the question like who feeds Atlanta and who determines which grocery stores will sell what at what price and which grocery stores should buy stuff at what specific time, there's no actual coordination um, for all of that. It just kind of happens behind the scenes magically um, as CVS and Kroger and all of these other companies um, just kind of pay attention to general prices. Um, and um, just pay attention to what is happening in the market. Um, if CVS decides to double the prices for double the price for Skittles, it will notice pretty quick that it's not going to sell enough Skittles. Um, so then, if it cuts the price by like in half and starts selling giant bags of Skittles for like a dollar, um, they'll run out really fast, and then they'll notice that they didn't earn their money back from from the price of purchasing the Skittles, and so that was a bad mistake. And so eventually, they'll settle on kind of a price. Um, just by themselves. Um, they'll, like, they're pretty good at it now. They have all sorts of inventory control. But if you were like a brand new company that had no access to computers um, or no access to other data or trends, then you would just kind of stumble into the price. You would notice if it was too high, nobody would buy it. If it was too low, everybody would buy it, and that would be bad. And so you're just going to fiddle with the price until it settles somewhere. And what's fascinating is as the Skittle, as CVS does that um, with Skittles, then the Skittles company will also change their production and they'll change how many Skittles they're making based on the demand for Skittles. Um, and again, nobody's telling them what they're doing. They're kind of looking at purchases from CVS and Kroger and Costco and everybody else. Um, but there's no general like agency that is in charge of regulating Skittle quantities. It just kind of happens. Um, and this is just one specific product, these Skittles, but it's the case for every single product. Um, all the food that you buy is just kind of it naturally settles on some sort of price and that's just how it is. Um, and the really fascinating thing about this is that price changes depending on context. Um, if you've been to an airport and you've tried to buy a bottle of water that would normally cost like 25 cents from the vending machine at Costco on your way out of the store, that same bottle of water costs like $3 in an airport. And it's not because it's special. And it's not because the airport is saying you must charge three dollars for this it's because um, the firms and the companies that work in an airport have noticed that if they raise their prices by a lot people will still buy their stuff um, because they're kind of a captive audience you can't bring your own water past tsa and so you're stuck with whatever is there um, after you go through security and so they can raise the price to whatever um, because they're the only place that can um, give you water um, except for drinking fountains um, and so that's that's kind of you're locked into a higher price and it's not because they're all coordinating um, evilly against you. There's no like um, shady cabal of water vendors in the airport. It's just that they can um, and they may have just stumbled into that. Like if they notice that the price is too low, they're going to run out of water really fast. If they start charging you like $30 for a water bottle, nobody's going to buy. And so they'll eventually settle on some price in between and it just happens. Um, and so that's this this magical concept here um, for how all of this this market-based 
institution stuff just kind of emerges um, and the prices that are out in the world just kind of emerge. Um, one really fascinating example of this, and we would do it in person if we were in person here, and you should do this if you're ever in a larger group of people. Um, this is kind of a fun game. You can show off to your friends of how economics works. Um, what you can do is you can simulate this idea of um, prices just kind of emerging naturally. If you use um, a deck of face cards and pretend that people uh, and hand out face cards to a whole bunch of people, um, people who get black cards are sellers. And in this game, their goal is to sell, in this example, a paperclip, but it could just be whatever. Um, and they're supposed to go, to go out into the world and find somebody with a red card and sell them this paperclip or piece of candy or whatever they're, they're trying to get rid of. Um, the number on the card here, right here, the seven, is the number is the, the price that the seller cannot sell below. So that's kind of their minimum price. And so if a buyer says, I want that paperclip for $3, um, the seller cannot. They're stuck at seven. So they can sell it for seven or eight or nine dollars or ten dollars or whatever, but their, their minimum is seven. So imagine a whole bunch of sellers out in the world with these different prices that are kind of their minimums. That's all they can, that's all they can sell for. Um, then you have people out in the world that are buyers, where they'll have kind of this, this price here, the number on this red card is their budget. They cannot pay above this number. So this person here is stuck with a three. And so they could go out into the world to try to find a paperclip or whatever product we're trying to sell here, but they're stuck with $3 and that's all they can work with. So if this three person met up with the seven person, they wouldn't actually be able to trade. The seven person can't go down to $3 and this three person can't go up to seven. And so this person is just out of that market, can't get anything from that person. But there are other people out in the world with different numbers. And so what happens in this simulation is I, give half the class red cards and half the class uh, black cards, and then I send them off and their job is to uh, spend three minutes wandering around the classroom and finding someone that they can make a deal with. And then they make some sort of deal. And so here's a hypothetical example of a seller and a buyer. Um, so the seller here, their minimum price is $4. This buyer, their maximum budget here is $9. And so this is a legal trade. Um, the buyer has enough money here and the seller can go like they're they're under their budget and so they can make some sort of deal here there's all sorts of deals they could make they could settle on four dollars that would be a really good deal for the buyer because they could go up to nine but if it's only four super neat um they could go up um to nine because that's the buyer's full budget the buyer could spend all nine dollars here and that they would still get kind of their paper clip but the seller would be super happy um, and so what happens when I do this in person is once these two people come to some sort of agreement on a price, they don't show each other their numbers. Um, they just say like, we'll negotiate and we'll say eight. Um, so if you look at this, think about who gets the better deal, who gets the better end of this deal here. Um, if they decide to sell this, this product, this paperclip for $8. Um, and so if you look at this, there's, if, if you're the seller, you wanted to sell it for four, but you could go higher than four, and you're suddenly selling it for eight. And that's a lot, that's four more. Um, if you're the buyer, you could go up to nine, but you'd be happy if it was lower because that's kind of your total budget. And so this is still a good deal for the buyer, um, but it's kind of close to their budget here. And so what I do to, to reward good deals in this, this game that I play in the classroom, um, what happens is when people, <clears throat> create a trade, they come up to the front of the room and I give them candy based on how good of a deal they made. And so the seller here would get four pieces of candy um, because there's a $4 difference between kind of their minimum price and the actual price they settle on. So that's kind of the extra bonus points that they get for making a really good deal. Had they decided on like a price of $6, the seller would have gotten two pieces of candy because it's just a little bit above kind of their minimum. The buyer in this situation only gets one piece of candy. Um, because it's a good deal, but it's not the greatest deal. Um, and so they get a little bit of extra bonus points. But in this situation, the winner of this, of this transaction here is definitely the seller. They got the best deal. 
And so the goal, we go through lots of rounds of this and we have just people go out into the world and bump into each other and try to, um, sellers try to sell their stuff to buyers and both people are trying to get the most candy possible. So they're trying to get the best deals. So if you're a buyer, you're gonna try to get the lowest price possible. If you're a seller, you're gonna try to get the highest price possible. And so people are out in the world and bumping into each other and what happens every time I do this um, is some sort of general price settles down um, generally on $6 or $5, depending on what cards I include for the general classroom. So if you look at this, this is from um, 2019, January 2019, where I did this in a class, um, where you had a whole bunch of different people. These are all the different trades that were made. So you see the, what, the first pair of people that came up to the front of the classroom, they decided $5 was a good price. The next pair, it was $3, and so that was really good for the... Um, for the seller, um, I think, in that situation, they got a ton of bonus points because, um, or for the buyer, because they had a budget that was way high. And so they got like seven bonus points there. And then the prices just eventually kind of settled down um, after the first round. If you notice how variable it is, um, it eventually settles down on a general price, um, regardless of people like trying to take advantage of their neighbors or their classmates. So if you, if you have like a really low, if you're a seller and you have a two, you're gonna go out there and start demanding 10 um, so you can get as many points as possible, but nobody's gonna wanna buy it. And so you have to start lowering, lowering your price down to something else. And so eventually people settle down on like five or six and that's the general price for everything. Um, in later rounds, I impose a tax, which, which raises the price by $2. And what happens every time is that the general price that everybody settles on also increases and it makes it more expensive for everybody. Um, and so what's, this is what happened at GSU in August of 2019, um, the same thing. Actually, in this, in this case, um, oddly enough, in the very first round, every single trade that happened was exactly $6. Nobody was able to get a price of eight or four. It just happened to be six every time. Round two, it was six and then five and then six. And then round three was six, 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 seven. Um, so the price was hovering around six, regardless of the cards that were out there. So even though people had tens and twos and could try to take advantage of the situation, they couldn't because if they did, nobody was gonna buy from them. And so they had to settle down on six. And the reason this happens is because of something fascinating called supply and demand. And we're gonna talk about this in a few sessions. Um, in lots of economics classes, you spend the first like two or three sessions just talking about supply and demand and you draw lines and curves and do all sorts of math and figure out where they intersect. We're not gonna do that yet. Um, we will get there, but don't worry about it yet. Um, this is just to show kind of this idea of, of how all of this coordination happens without kind of a minister of paper clips or a minister of cards out in the world. So if you take all of the black cards that are out in this classroom, so if you imagine there are nine, nine people that were sellers in this classroom, and if you lay them all up like this, um, just in kind of a line here, um, going up from lowest to highest, um, we can call that a supply curve or the supply line because these are what the sellers have. So there's some sellers that like their minimum price is 10, there are other sellers, their minimum price is two, and so it just kind of goes up. And what's really cool is if you make a similar line with all of the buyers and what they're willing to pay and what their budgets are all the way down, you get this. This is called a demand line or a demand curve. In economics, they always call lines curves because they have the potential to be curves, um, even though it's, it's just a line here. And so most of the time when we talk about like supply curves and demand curves, they're just straight lines and then they could potentially be curvy, but um, curve includes lines. Um, so what's fascinating here is if you look at, these are all of the buyers, their budgets that they had. What happens is where do they cross? The two cross right here at six. And that is the price that always gets settled on, regardless of um, me trying to intervene or people trying to take advantage of others. Um, it always kind of settles back down onto six. And that's, that's the general price that just emerges. 
Um, it's not always that way. You can, you can manipulate this. If you add more red cards that are low, um, that will shift the shape of this line. And then where they cross will be somewhere else. And so in other classes, I've been able to raise the price to like eight, um, depending on how many red cards I put in or how many black cards I put in. Um, but you have total control over what the ultimate, ultimate average price will be. Um, so fun party game here next time you um, can have a party outside of quarantine and social distancing. Um, you can do this and impress all your friends and you can predict what the general price will be um, just based on the number of cards out there and everybody's um, willingness to buy and their budgets and their willingness to sell, which is super fascinating. Um, if you graph this more formally, um, instead of using the, the cards, this is just drawing lines, but um, using the same values we had with the cards, um, you'll see it crosses here at six, and so that's the price. Um, this gray line, that's after I introduced the tax, it raised the price um, by a dollar. Um, and we'll talk about why that happens later on in the semester. Um, but yeah, like what's really fascinating here is that without any outside intervention, without any explicit coordination, none of the people in the classroom as they're, as they're wandering around and bouncing into each other, they're not trying to figure out a general price for all of society. They're just kind of bargaining and then the price just naturally settles on six because it does. Um, the official term for this in economics is something called the invisible hand, which you may have heard of um, in past classes, or this is kind of a common thing that people know about in economics. Um, the general principle behind it is that as everybody is working in their own self-interest, um, just trying to get the best deal and get the most bonus candy in this transaction, as everybody's trying to do that, um, the general collective market and all of society just kind of settles into um, kind of its official uh, price. And so like you have official order and order and um, um, yeah, order in society um, and prices in the market, not because of any centralized authority, just because people are bouncing into each other and, and bumping into each other and figuring out how to trade with each other. Um, so Adam Smith is the one who invented this phrase here. And he has this term here, um, or this phrase here that with this invisible hand, it's like economic efficiency and prices don't come from like the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker. Um, it's just everybody working in their own self-interest is what makes the economy work. Um, which means like the butcher is not thinking about if I sell this piece of meat to this person, um, what is that going to do to global meat, uh, meat prices? He doesn't care. He's just selling the meat to people. Um, just so that he can get kind of food for his family. Um, and then the brewer, she's not paying attention to kind of global alcohol prices if she engages in, in some sort of activity. She's just trying to sell her stuff. And so as everybody's kind of narrowly focused on their own self-interest, um, general social trends emerge automatically and general prices emerge automatically and general market dynamics just kind of happen by themselves. So that's this idea of the invisible hand, um, which is fascinating because if we think about institutions, which are these rules that govern things, um, this invisible hand and this market idea is a fascinating example of kind of a spontaneous institution that just happens. Um, and so it's a really important concept in economics, and we're going to be talking about it um, throughout the rest of the semester, especially as we talk about um, supply and demand and how firms interact in markets. And we'll get to that in a few sessions.